so I have way less slides than Steve, and I'm probably also not going to reach his words per minute. Uh, but uh, this is, I think, the first in-person conference talk I've been I have given since 2019, uh, where I already was at Kernel Recipe. So it's a really great conference, and thanks for inviting me again. Um, I want to talk about the work that we did over the last two years, um, specifically work around ID map mounts. Is there anyone in the audience that's sort of interested in VFS stuff that already knows a little bit about this? So hands up. Wow, so many people. Uh, no. Um, so the idea is roughly that you can change ownership on a, a per VFS mount basis, but I'm uh, going to walk you through this in a little more detail. Um, so first, uh, we need to briefly talk about ownership information. So the VFS uh, expresses ownership information through UADs and GADs. And uh, this is obviously similar to how we express ownership in uh, other places in the kernel as well. And uh, the VFS has various ownership concepts, among, the, among them generic DAC permissions, uh, POSIX ACLs, which may store additional UIDs and GIDs uh, on disk, and file system capabilities, which can also store additional ownership information, so UIDs specifically. And the kernel, and here specifically the VFS, uses this information to check permissions to determine, for example, whether a caller is allowed to interact uh, with an inode or not. It can mean different things, create a new inode, uh, change the ownership of an inode, and so on. So most block-based, uh, block device-based file systems, uh, so file systems that uh, raise FS requires def, which is a flag in the specific file system struct, uh, will persist such ownership information uh, to disk. So they will actually store it uh, on some device. There are exceptions, of course, as always. So file systems that do not implement the proper form of uh, DAC permission, such as FAT, for example, don't store ownership information at all on disk. So what they usually provide is uh, a way to change ownership at mount time by, for example, providing a UID or GID mount option, which then determines or tells the VFS uh, what, uh, what ownership the inode is supposed to have. So obviously, um, the VFS needs to learn uh, that ownership information to use for a given file. And uh, when a lookup operation is initiated, a new struct inode will be allocated, and the file system will read the ownership information from disk, in case the inode is not in the iCache, and then update uh, struct inode, uh, the struct inode's IUID and IGID members. And the ownership information is filled in by calling to, to file system developers at least well-known functions called IUID read and IUID uh, write. And the IUID read function is used when reading ownership information uh, from a struct inode and writing it to disk. And the IUID write function is used when reading ownership information from disk and storing it uh, in a struct inode. So the naming can be confusing here a little, I know, but the read and write here are taken relative to a uh, struct inode. So either struct inode is read or a uh, struct inode is written to. And so when viewed this way, the names do actually make uh, some more sense. So the interesting bit here is that under the hood, the IUID read and IUID write functions don't just transfer ownership information from or to struct inode uh, to this they also perform a translation or a mapping. And the VFS itself, uh, or the kernel itself actually, doesn't deal with raw UIDs and GIDs as stored on disk, but it deals with KUIDs and KGIDs, which is a separate type that just encapsulate uh, UIDs and GIDs. So the IUID read and IUID write functions call two functions under the hood, which are called make KUID and from KUID to translate between raw UIDs and GID values as they are stored on disk and uh, into and from KUIDs and KGIDs. So the IUID read function calls from KUID and it translates a kernel UID to a raw UID or a value that you would actually store on disk. And the IUID write function calls make KUID which then translates uh, raw UIDs as they are stored on disk um, into KUIDs. So for all interesting file systems that we know, and by interesting file systems I mean XFS, uh, X4, ButterFS and so on, the translation between those two types is an identity translation with respect to the actual values 
So meaning that the value that is stored on disk is the same as the value that ends up in struct inodes, uh, IUID and IUID, IGID member. And so for the common case, IUID read and IUID write will yield different types for the kernel, but with the same uh, value. But in some circumstances, uh, the actual values can differ. And this is where we need to talk uh, ID mappings for a bit. Who uh, uh, knows what ID mappings are or has heard of this in the context of the kernel? Oh, yeah, quite a few more, OK. So ID mapping is essentially just a translation of a range of IDs into another or even the same range uh, of IDs. And the notational convention for ID mappings that I'm going to use here is uh, U colon K colon R, uh, where U indicates the first element in the upper ID map set and k indicates the first element in the lower ID map set, and r is a parameter that indicates the range of the ID mapping, so it means how many IDs are mapped. And in the context of this talk and in the context of the kernel, an ID mapping can be interpreted as mapping a range of user space IDs into a range of kernel IDs. So you can also interpret this as a user space ID colon kernel ID colon range. And note, this is important, that we are only concerned with ID mappings as they are stored in the kernel, we, not how user, user space would specify them, because user space has to write ID mappings, and then internally the kernel does additional translation mechanisms, but it's, it's a bit, it would be a bit too involved to uh, explain this here in, in too much detail. So we only care about what is actually stored in the kernel. So for the rest of this document, uh, we will prefix uh, um, IDs with U uh, and all kernel IDs with K, and ranges of ID mappings will be um, prefixed with R just to make it clear uh, in what direction we are going, because this will be important. And the kernel ID is always created by an ID mapping. And such uh, ID mappings are associated with struct user namespace. And since we mainly care about how ID mappings work, I'm not going to be concerned with uh, what they mean in the context of user namespaces in general. We are just care about the file system context here. And the initial struct user namespace is special, so this is where you are located when you just interact with your host system. And uh, it always has the following ID mapping. It has the ID mappings zero, uh, U0 zero, uh, to K0 for the whole range, so for the full 32-bit range. So it maps pretty obvious what it does, right? It maps 0 to 0, 1 to 1, 2 to 2, and so on, uh, until that number that I'm not going to pronounce. Um, so it's full identity mapping uh, over the full range of IDs that are available on a system. But other struct user namespaces, in the context of containers, for example, they have usually have non-ID identity mappings, uh, such as in this case, uh, 0 to 10,000, uh, it's a 10,000 yeah, and a range of 10,000 IDs. So what uh, does this do? Well, uh, this maps uh, UID 0 to kernel ID 10,000, right? And then it map maps 1 to 10,001, 2 to 10,002, and then 3 to 10,003. So it maps it to a range way back on the system. And uh, the algorithm that you can use to calculate what a given ID maps to is pretty simple. So first we need to verify that the range can actually contain our target ID. But I've skipped this, it would take too long. <laughs> and uh, after that, if we want to know what ID maps to, we can do simple calculations. So if we want to know uh, map down from a user space ID to a kernel ID, then we can simply do uh, what you see right here. We take the ID that we want to map, we subtract the first user space ID, we add the first kernel ID, and then we get the target number. So you, you can check this, for example, with uh, user space ID 1000. We subtract the first user space ID, gives us 0, plus 10,000 gives us 11,000. And uh, if we want to know uh, what a given uh, kernel ID maps up to, so to what user space ID are we going in the other direction, essentially. So we take the ID uh, that we want to uh, map up, we subtract the first kernel ID, we add the first user space ID, and then we get the number. So if we have 11,000 as the kernel ID that we want to know to what user space ID it maps to, we subtract the first kernel ID in the mapping, which is 10,000, we add the first uh, user space mapping, and then we get user space ID uh, 1,000. And as you can see, these two ID mappings, they invert each other. So from that perspective, it's, it's fairly straightforward, I think. So let's go back 
to uh, the IUID read and IUID write functions we introduced earlier. We saw that they translate between raw UIDs and GIDs and KUIDs and KGIDs. So let's say the VFS has initiated a lookup. So for example, a lookup operation for non-VFS people happens every time you call open, for example, and the VFS wants to see if this thing is stored actually in the cache or uh, do I need to call into the file system and the file system needs to actually read something from the disk and fill up that information. Uh, that I know for you. Uh, and so let's assume we are, uh, we are hitting a case where the inode is not in the iCache. So we end up calling into the file system to fill in the truck inode uh, with relevant ownership information from disk and consider a file that is stored on disk by a file system as being owned by user space ID 1000. So as we said, all interesting file systems are mounted with the initial ID mapping. And as we saw, the initial ID mapping is simply an identity mapping. And that would mean IUID write will read uh, user space ID 1000 from disk and turn it into uh, kernel UID 1000. So struct inodes, IUID and IGID member here, they would contain kernel ID 1000. Nothing surprising. Um, but if file systems were mountable, for example, with a non-ID identity mapping, such as 0 maps to 10,000, 1 to 10,001, and so on, then IUID write would read uh, user space ID 1000 from disk and, for example, return uh, turn it into kernel ID 11,000 and store that in struct inode. So struct inodes, IUID, and IGID fields would contain uh, kernel ID 11,000 uh, in this example. Here you see a few examples that uh, do these informations for various file systems, XFS inode to disk for X, XFS X for do update inode, fill inode item for bufferfs, and so on. All file systems need to do this in some shape or form. Um, the other direction is when IUID write uh, comes into play. So the VFS calls into the file system because either uh, someone has created a file or because the ownership of a file has changed. So someone has called Joan, for example. So in either case, at some point, we need to transfer uh, the ownership information as stored in struct inode to reflect the correct ownership on disk. So sticking with our earlier example where we had a file um, that was stored on disk as being owned by UID and GID 1000, uh, when the file system is mounted with the initial ID mapping, uh, nothing interesting really happens. So the IUID write helper uh, will have written uh, kernel UID 1000 into struct inode. And consequently, if we use IUID write to transfer ownership uh, information from struct inode to disk, we simply get user space ID 1000 back. Again, if the file system were to be mounted with an ID mapping, for example, zero mapping to 10,001 10, to uh, 10,001 and 1,000 to 11,000, uh, then we saw that IUID write will have translated to the raw UID and GID 1,000 uh, earlier, stored on disk into 11,000 and stored this value in struct inode. So when we want to write ownership to disk, we need to reverse this ID mapping. And so the IUID read uh, function will consequently translate 11,000 into 1,000, which is what will be written to disk. And this translation in both directions guarantees it's basically an order isomo uh, isomorphism, if you want to look at it uh, a bit more formally. But um, ID mappings don't just figure into the VFS and uh, the disk boundary. They are also important at the user space and VFS uh, uh, boundary. And so to illustrate this, we can look at what happens when a new directory, for example, uh, is created. So um, when a creating a file system object, the VFS uh, will look at the call as file system IDs. And this is nothing fancy. They are just regular UID and GID values, but they are exclusively used when determining file ownership, uh, which is why they are called file system uh, UIDs. So when the caller enters the kernel, two things happen right away. So the caller's user space IDs are mapped down into kernel IDs in the caller's ID mapping, which is determined by what username space it's located in. And uh, to be precise, actually, the kernel will just look at current FS UID, which gives you the file system UID that the task is currently using. And then um, it will verify that the caller's kernel IDs can be mapped up to user space IDs in the file system's ID mapping. And the second step is important because, as we have seen, at some point, any regular file system will ultimately have to map the kernel ID back up into user space ID when writing it to disk via IUID read. And so, so with the second step, the kernel guarantees that a valid user space ID will be written to disk. So it, the kernel will refuse any creation request when the ID maps to some shenanigans in the file system. For example, you come in with an ID that uh, returns minus one, which is the invalid UID and GID, and the kernel, which is the VFS specifically, will refuse to write anything like that to the disk.
So what BFS does with this is to translate between two different ID mappings using the, the kernel ID map set, so the, the, yeah, the kernel ID map set of these two ID mappings. Um, and the relevant ID mappings here are the callers ID mapping and the file systems ID mapping. And the algorithm, um, I have a documentation in, uh, in documentation that says file system slash ID mappings that goes into a lot more detail here. The algorithm that's used here, we, we, I like to call cross mapping because you're essentially connecting two different ID mappings. Say a caller with UID 1000 enters the kernel. So you see the three relevant ID mappings, uh, two relevant ID mappings. You see caller ID 1000, you see the caller's ID mapping is, for example, um, a mapping where zero is mapped to 10,000 and the file system's ID mapping maps uh, files that are around by 20,000 on disk to kernel ID at 10,000. So the first thing that the kernel will do is will uh, map the caller's ID uh, 1000 into a kernel ID, which here gives 11,000. It's the example we've used before. That's basically just current FSU ID, and then it will call. Oh, sorry, and then it will call from KU ID, and to, will look up this kernel ID. What raw user space ID does it map up to in the file system's ID mapping? And then, for example, you get back. 21,000. So that would be the ID, the raw value that would need to be uh, put to this. That's the whole algorithm. And uh, now we essentially have all the, uh, the pieces in place to understand how the VFS disk boundary and the user space uh, VFS boundary uh, is handled with respect to ID mappings. And the IUID read and IUID write function will always be looking at the ID mapping of the file system. And the point that I want to drive home here uh, before we go on is that in the world prior to ID map mounts, file ownership could only be changed via tone by making the file system mountable by unprivileged users. So allowing a file system to be mountable by an unprivileged user uh, allows to alter file system ownership file system wide according to the associated ID mapping that the, uh, of the caller. And uh, this information is represented in the file system super blocked and it's determined at mount time. So you mount the file system, the iCache is initialized and the ownership information is filled in for the various inodes based on the ID mapping that is effective at the time you mounted the file system. Um, but it's important to note that most file systems don't allow this to protect themselves against, for example, malicious file system images. And because creating a super block is arguably a privileged operation that should be under uh, control of the administrator. So neither XFS, neither X4, ButterFS, all the uh, real block-based file systems, uh, block device-based file systems, don't actually, uh, can't be mounted inside uh, of user namespaces so or by unprivileged users. And all file systems mountable with ID mappings, uh, as I said, are sub therefore currently FS requires def file systems. So stuff like uh, uh, that don't raise FS requires def. Sorry. So stuff like tempfs, sysfs, procfs, def tempfs, binderfs. What do we have? Uh, and overlayfs. So any file system that is a pseudo file system, more or less. So I just want to briefly look at uh, two use cases, well, more or less two use cases um, from uh, that can't be handled by the current way, or can't be nicely handled uh, by the current way, how we do, um, how we uh, handle ownership on file systems. So the first of all is uh, systemd. So systemd, uh, uh, newer systemd versions implement a concept called uh, portable home directories. And the goal is to make it trivial uh, to transport home directories between uh, different machines. Um, so to do this, systemd, by what I mean is, for example, you could have your home directory on a USB, USB disk, some other external device. You take it between two different machines, plug it in, and so on. Uh, and to do this, systemd will all uh, make all files owned on disk um, be owned by UID and GID 65534, which is the nobody user. And uh, at logging time, it will assign a random, U random, um, pseudo random UID and GID from the range 60,001 to 60,513. And uh, the assigned UID and GID isn't fixed, so it means it can change from one login to the next and from one machine to the other. There is a whole machinery to integrate with the system. It uses glibc, NSS, and so on. So it's all registered as soon as you log in. The same UID can't be uh, can't be given again, and so on. So uh, in order to make this uh, ownership uh, ownership work correctly for files for your home directory, systemd will or has uh, before uh, 
recursively changed ownership using the Jones system call for all files in the user's home directory. And uh, this brings various sources for errors, obviously. So the ownership information is changed permanently and globally. The recursive Jones might fail in the middle. We've seen that. Um, and leaving behind the system where some files are changed, other files aren't. Uh, every time the login UID and GID changes, you need to uh, do the recursive chown again. Um, the home directory might contain files that aren't owned by the user, but by some other UID and GID. And the home directory might be huge, uh, so there's a very large number of files, which makes the recursive chown uh, pretty costly. So users don't really have a lot of options. So even if the file system that the user's home directory um, is located in were to be mountable inside of, for example, user namespace, which they can't, then uh, a user logging in into the machine would need to be placed inside of a sandbox, effectively, uh, a new user in mount namespace, which would make the home directory or the, the system more or less unusable, uh, especially if it's a user that can raise privileges uh, through sudo, for example. So uh, another range of examples comes obviously from uh, containers. Uh, most workloads today still run in privileged containers, uh, meaning root inside the container is root outside of the container. But a lot of workloads can and should actually run in unprivileged containers. It increases isolation. It's obviously no guarantee. If you want hard guarantees, use a VM um, between the host and container. But if you have cooperative workloads, the workloads need to be uh, isolated from uh, one another. Unprivileged container are uh, pretty good. So um, they aren't widely adopted, though. And by the way, if I mean unprivileged, then I mean containers where they use a user namespace and an ID mapping is in play. Um, they are widely adopted, um, even though the technology that they use has been around since 2013. And uh, the reason is that the file system story isn't really nice, uh, as we've seen here. So as more runtimes make uh, use of unprivileged containers, it includes Lexi, RunC, what have you, the whole cloud shenanigans that we have nowadays, Pokemon, Docker. Um, they all face uh, the same problem around file system access. And uh, since unprivileged containers make use of ID mappings to isolate UID 0 inside the container from UID outside of the container, uh, this will also affect file system ownership. So the container can run into various uh, problems rather quickly. So as we've seen, if you map UID 0 to uh, UID 10,000, and then you have an algorithm where you enter the kernel, and uh, the first thing that is done is that your current FS UIDs, your file system UID, is mapped from 0 to 10,000. Uh, and then the kernel looks up uh, 10,000, uh, 10, for example, inside, uh, tries to determine whether or not you are privileged over a file in a given file system. It will also look at the ID mapping in effect, and it will find out that uh, you are user ID 10,000, but the file on this uh, as UID 0, so you can't really do anything with the file. So file system access really doesn't work in this scenario. Um, so uh, the solution is obviously, um, it, it, if you, is to recursively chone, right? Uh, I've mentioned this before. So uh, all by mounting the root file system inside of an unprivileged container, but both solutions have uh, pretty severe drawbacks and they might not even be uh, available. So another problem is sharing data between uh, the host and an unprivileged container. So you have your, I don't know, you want to uh, mount your home directory inside of your container and make it writable. You want to uh, share some data uh, that uh, whose ownership you can change or you don't want to change uh, with the container. And the solution, again, would be recursively shown. If you don't want this, tough luck. Uh, we can't mount the file system inside of the container because it has already been mounted on the host, if you want to share data. Um, and we wouldn't be able to share it with the host if we did mount it in the container. So uh, it's, uh, it's not very nice. Similar problems uh, apply when we're trying to share data between unprivileged containers with different ID mappings. So if you want to increase the isolation between uh, two different containers, then you can have non-overlapping ID mappings assigned to them so that if you, know, you can't do anything if you enter the other container and so on. And uh, in, this, uh, in this case, even if you chone, you will always end up with files that one container can't interact with because choning to the ID mapping of one container will leave it inaccessible to the other one. So there is another set of special problems around uh, uh, runtimes that use overlayFS, which most do in order to share the rootFS between different containers. So um, like, for example, you have a bunch of different, if you start 10 containers, they're all Ubuntu-based, and your rootFS is Ubuntu-based, or Fedora-based, or SUSE-based, 
um, then it makes it for a lot of use cases you don't need to duplicate all of that data meaning you don't need to copy you have 10 containers and for each container you give it a separate rule of s you duplicate all of the files so they have the exact same set of files all of those 10 containers you fill it in you waste a lot of space right especially if you have a full distro if it's a large container so what most of them end up doing is they have one read-only layer which is the lower layer and then each container gets, gets a writable directory. I'm making this very simple now, but gets a writable directory. And then you mount an overlay FS mount on top of it, which exposes the same set of files to these 10 different containers. The storage isn't duplicated. It's just one single uh, directory, more or less. Uh, and then each container uh, writes into a separate directory. So it's essentially just a delta between those containers that actually, actually the difference uh, that the containers make when they create or delete files and so on. And uh, that story doesn't work anymore as soon as you have user namespaces in play. Imagine you have one privileged container which runs without an ID mapping. You have an unprivileged container that maps UID 0 to 10,000. You have another one that maps 0 to 20,000 and so on. So there is no way to do nice layer sharing in this scenario because you can only change the ID mapping globally and uh, uh, yeah, forever, more or less. Um, the problem is you would need to duplicate storage if you want to solve this because then you need to give each uh, container a different root of S. Uh, the recursive change in ownership also causes a lot of uh, yeah, performance overhead, um, especially if you have large containers that grow over time. If you need to change ownership on this, it's, it's all kind of messy. So um, this is where ID map come into play, which allow for uh, temporary and localized ownership changes. And uh, the idea is, they start with the idea that file ownership really should be expressible on a per mount basis instead of a file system wide basis. And ID map mounts allow to expose the same set of files with different ownership um, at different mounts. And uh, the ID mapping associated with it is then used to translate uh, from the caller's ID mapping to the file system's ID mapping and vice versa using uh, remapping algorithms. So ID map mounts make it possible to change ownership in a temporary and the localized way. So localized because ownership changes are restricted to a specific mount and temporary because the ownership changes are tied to the lifetime uh, of a mount. So all other users and locations where the file system uh, is exposed are unaffected. So file systems that support ID map mounts don't have any real reason to support being mountable and privileged anymore, by the way. So files could be exposed completely uh, under an ID map mount to get essentially the same effect as having it mountable inside of a user namespace. So this is the advantage that file systems can leave the creation of the super, super block to privileged users or to the administrator. But it is possible to combine ID map mounts with file systems mountable by unprivileged users. So this isn't possible right now, but the, the algorithms allow for it uh, no problem. So the use case uh, I mentioned above uh, and more, they are handled by ID map mounts uh, and they are already handled by ID map mounts in various applications uh, right now. So uh, I could go into the details of how the uh, remapping algorithms work and uh, we can do this in a little bit if you are really interested but we can also I can also do a quick demo to first of all get the uh, idea across so what would you prefer okay let's see uh, uh, uh. okay how, how large should I go yeah Okay, um, let's actually see if I can, okay. So, I have created a directory called source mount. This is uh, more or less picking up the uh, systemd example that I mentioned before. So, uh, slash, so uh, slash source uh, dash mount, and it has a bunch of files in there. In this case, uh, nobody no group. So if we look at the numeric value, that should be LSLN. Um, and you see the directory and the file are owned by uh, 65534, uh, which is uh, a user that, yeah, the nobody, no group user. Uh, so it doesn't have any special permissions and anything. Uh, and anything. So I, I can't really do a lot with this uh, file system. I don't know if I made it nicely writable, but, uh, or if I have to write permissions, but if I do touch some file. Yeah, okay, then I get permission denied, so I can't really do anything with this. Um, so, but we can change this. I mean, I could show them, right? 
uh, but that's not why we uh, why we're here. So uh, Carl should soon merge the a new extension to the mount binary. But what you can do is uh, mount. Uh, ah, that was sorry. Um, so we can do this. So what this does is it uses the normal mount binary. The mount binary has a bunch of additional um, options that you might or might not know about, uh, which are called uh, x dash mount, uh, either with a big X or with a small X, and that relates to how mount options are internally stored and where they are stored. Uh, but these are uh, uh, yeah these are mount options that are more or less understood by um, the mount binary itself, not necessarily. Uh, by the file system and in this case for example um, the mount binary passes the ID mapping I'm passing it um, and so what I'm doing right here is I'm uh, uh, using dash dash bind create a bind mount Most people should be familiar with what a bind mount is I assume and then I'm using dash o uh, x dash uh, mount dot ID map equals and then what I say right here is 65534 colon 1000 uh, colon 1 is map 65534 to user ID uh, 1000 uh, in the target mount. A lot of words for something that should be. Ah, uh, yes. I should not have my made my password as complicated as I did. Damn it! Um, so let's look at find mount first. Um, it's going great, as you can see. Um, that's my mount table. Now I need to find slash mount. Should have grabbed for it. Oh, here it is. So this is target mount. You can see it's a bind mount. Um, that's the source mount directory. It's an XFS file system. It's read write. Uh, and there is a new mount uh, option called ID mapped as you can see right here, and then a bunch of other mount options. So you look at source mount, okay, nothing has really changed. As I said, if I want to create a file in there, then I'm out of luck. And uh, if we look at target mount, we see a nice surprise. Uh, we see that it should be changed. Now all of these files are owned by my user ID. So if I, uh, let's so I don't trick you. 1000, this is my uh, UID on this host. So if I do target mount, and uh, let's say I create a new file in there, it works. And if I look at this, then you can see it created a file as the user ID 1000. Uh, trick question what uh, uh, UID and GID is stored on disk? Yeah, exactly. So if you go into a uh, source mount, then you will see that the file is stored on disk as uh, nobody, uh, no group. Like for example, you know, stuff that you can do with this uh, on a host, if you had a service isolation mechanism, you could have uh, user ID 0 write to disk with user ID 1000 or with nobody, no group, so that they don't can create any set UID binaries. Conversely, you can obviously also make someone with UID 1000 write to disk as UID 0, which probably you only want to do when you're very sure about your security story. And uh, that's more or less the, the whole story that's behind ID map mounts. I can show you one more thing, for example. Like imagine you have a really large container, right? Um, you download uh, a file system and the rootfs file system, like two gigabytes large, whatever, and uh, you create an unprivileged container which uses an ID mapping. So the first thing that you have to do, you pull the image, you unpack the image, and then you recursively join through the whole root file system to change the ownership of each individual file, which takes a very long time. So container startup becomes very costly. Um, if you do this with ID map mounts, for example, say local f1, this is just a container manager tool, don't worry about it. Um, retrieving image, unpack, done. And uh, you can see that file ownership right here works just fine. So, no, well, um, 
you see everything is owned uh, owned by root even though I'm using a UID mapping and the files on disk haven't actually changed and this is because the uh, user namespace of the container has been attached to the VFS mount that's the that's the whole trick that's the whole uh, story so let's skip over the boring part where I explain the algorithm in detail if you're really interested in this documentation slash file system slash ID mapping dot RST uh, it's explained in detail um, let's skip over that uh, UAPI so a while ago uh, a new system I introduced a new system call which was necessary independent of it ID map mounts it wasn't a motivator for it the motivator was we didn't have we have a new mount API which is purely file descriptor based which is um, instead of paths, uh, which is pretty important uh, for user space in terms of security. And uh, it had a bunch of functions, but you couldn't change mount attributes after the fact, uh, which was pretty problematic. So you still had to fall back to the regular old boring mount tool, for example. Um, and also, I don't know how many uh, know this, um, let's say you want to recursively make a whole mount tree read only. Mount doesn't allow you to do this. What you need to do is you need to walk each individual mount uh, point beneath a given mount point and then turn each of those mounts uh, read only, which is royally annoying. I think mount might do this for you or not, I'm not completely sure, but so the other motivation was we needed uh, a way to change mount attributes recursively, which mount set adder uh, lets you do as well. But for the, so you can recursively change uh, no dev, uh, no suit, no exec and so on. And the other neat thing is that um, the old mount tool uh, required you to always specify the uh, absolute set of mount uh, of mount options that you wanted to have. What I mean by this is if you had a mount that was read only and uh, you wanted to make it no exec and you specified uh, mount remount uh, uh, ms bind uh, ms no exec then it stripped the read only flag because you didn't strip because you didn't specify the read only flag again so you needed to make sure to pass exactly the mount options that you want to have mount set adder for example has uh, an adder clear and an adder set member and then if you specify uh, mount uh, mount adder no exec in the adder set member then it will add the mount no exec but it will not strip the read only flag it will leave it uh, in touch um, and if you actually want to retrieve, uh, remove the read-only flag, then you need to set it in uh, adder clear. So, you know, it has a bunch of, uh, bunch of nicer properties. It also uses an extensible argument struct, uh, so you can, there can be uh, more mount options added that are not flag, uh, <laughs> added later that are not flag based. And uh, for ID map mount specifically, uh, what you need to do is you need to get a private detached mount. Um, this is also something that the new mount API allows you to do. What I mean by this is it is a clone of an existing mount that is not attached anywhere in the file system, which is obviously great because you can create a private mount uh, and then nobody can fiddle with it because this file descriptor is private to yourself, um, which is pretty neat. Um, <clears throat> and if you can never, you, you can also uh, have it never show up in the file system if you want to. And uh, then you need to take you take this uh, FT tree file descriptor that we get back from Open Tree here. Uh, you raise the mount adder ID map flag in the adder set uh, member, and then you pass in a file descriptor for user namespace, usually for a container, or um, if you have set up a user namespace just to create an ID map mount that works as well. And then you pass it to mount set adder. Uh, here I'm raising the add recursive flag, which would ID map the whole uh, mount, mount, mount tree straight through. So that's more or less the user space API. Once an ID map mount has been ID mapped, you cannot change the ID mapping anymore. That makes lifetime issues uh, go away. Like for example, let's say we get a file system and the file system is currently calling, uh, performing some sort of operation uh, and uh, the VFS is changing the ID mapping on a mount, then you could cause a UAF and you know you don't want to make it too difficult. Um, I also linked you a demo into the slides, which I'm going to put up uh, later. So support and adoption. Um, yeah, file systems need to be uh, changed a little bit, but most patches are uh, fairly small. 
And currently we have uh, support. We started initially with X4, with XFS, which uh, Christoph did for me, so pretty great. Um, we have FAT, so you can take a USB stick and you can have it uh, mounted to different locations with different ownership if you wanted to, something which couldn't be done before. Um, both the MS-DOS and the VFAT version, I have no idea what the MS-DOS FAT version is to be honest, we seem to have it in the kernel. Um, in 5.15 we uh, gained ButterFS support and this new NTFS3 driver, though I had nothing to do with this. In 5.18 F2FS and in 5.19 we had EROPSF, which wins the uh, award for smallest patch to support this feature, it's, more, it's one line. And um, I did work to support overlay FS in 5.19, meaning you can have ID map lower layers, which solves this whole container shenanigans problem. So you can share the same root FS, create uh, individual ID map mounts for each container, and then mount overlay FS on top of it. And you get rid of all of this data uh, replication uh, issue and so on that we uh, mentioned before. Um, this thing is. Uh, pretty much uh, extensively tested. Um, there is a whole test feed for this in XFS tests, uh, which originally was 15k lines, so uh, then I was told to fill it up. And um, uh, it has like 47 test functions, 120 tests uh, overall, and it tests all kinds of stuff from uh, with user namespaces, without user namespaces. Uh, it's available with all file systems, uh, and it's I think by now run by most uh, by most uh, folks that use that have an XFS test client side uh, test suite. And um, there is a bunch of tools that uh, support it already with systemd, containerd, c run, run c, lexi, lexd, podman, the open container initiative has something in the runtime spec for this now, the mount tool in util Linux will support it, and uh, I just learned that uh, Kubernetes will use this stuff as well, so um, if there are any serious security bugs, I will soon know, uh, probably. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, more or less uh, it. There is a there is a little more work to do um, in in the future. Um, I think and people will probably come up uh, with new exciting extensions around this. Um, but yeah, uh, per amount ownership changes. And that's it. If you have any questions. Um, the, um, the stuff with containers, uh, with nesting containers, so containers inside containers would probably also, uh, could also be handled there, uh, yeah. with, with ID map and then applying ID map again. So, yeah, this is an interesting story. Uh, this is an interesting story how we would go about handling this. So, um, currently, uh, the privilege level, level that you require is you need to have, uh, you need to be privileged over the super block of the file system. Um, and then you can change, uh, you can create ID map mounts. And I currently at least don't have any plans to lower this privilege requirement because I think a container manager um, that wants to make use of this feature should be sufficiently privileged to set this up for the container it is running. For nested containers, we can probably um, we can probably have a story uh, where you can create a detached mount without an ID mapping, given the right privileges. Uh, based on an ID map mount. So you create a detached mount, you strip all of the properties from the mount, including the uh, ID mapping, and then you can attach the ID mapping of the nested container uh, to the mount, mm -hmm. which would solve the problem. But because I sort of had a similar idea uh, in my head where I thought maybe we should rethink the um, UR IDs and have a tree instead. So that uh, each UID would have uh, could 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 split uh, could uh, have multiple sub IDs and th these can have sub IDs as well and so on and can they just just link them through but it's yeah it's a yeah no no I mean it's, uh, it's, uh, I was just uh, my was more or less not just directed at the implementation complexity yeah. but also the argument uh, making that argument uh, to the VFS folks to the VFS yeah yeah I mean it's 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 a it's a crazy idea but I thought yeah. that like this this kind of thing we can yeah, have containers and containers and containers <laughs> yeah so con containers can be nested mm. which okay for better or worse yeah thanks <laughs>
Hi. Uh, so, what kind of changes did the file system have to do to support this this feature? So, most of these uh, changes are abstracted in in the VFS layer. So. Um, uh, all file systems in the VFS layer in the sense of uh, if your file system doesn't directly muck with UIDs and GIDs, for example XFS did this because it has uh, pretty nice quota support, so there were a few locations in XFS where we actually needed to call the low level, low level ID mapping functions that I added in the mount underscore ID mapping dot H header. Um, otherwise, all of that functionality is directly in the VFS, and the, the task that you need to do is essentially just um, pass down the new struct mount user namespace argument into the file system down into the VFS function, because currently all file systems that don't support it use a dummy uh, mapping, uh, uh, the initial ID mapping, so that if the initial ID mapping is passed, then uh, that this is a sign for the uh, translation or um, uh, algorithms to see, okay, this is identity mapping, I don't need to do anything, thank you very much. Um, and then it needs to raise fs underscore allow underscore id map in, in its fs flags, which all of these file systems do. And uh, the easiest is if you look at the patches that implemented for x4, for xfs and so on. Um, uh, and then you can see different levels of complexity. X4 is fairly straightforward, it's just uh, modifying a bunch of functions. XFS is a little more involved because it has these two places where it uh, does uh, muck with UIDs and GIDs directly. ButterFS was, for example, a little more complex because ButterFS is one of those file systems that, as I like to call it, go behind the VFS's back in creating objects. Um, which is fine, but it uses IOCLs, and then you can have an IOCL that creates subvolumes and it creates snapshots and so on. And the problem then becomes um, that all of the, usually all of the translation and permission checking is done in the VFS itself, which guarantees a standard, yeah, pretty much that every file system is using the same permission level for their creation operations. But in this case, the permission checks are duplicated in the IOCL code path of the file system. And so uh, we needed to, uh, first of all, check which IOCLs are safe to be exposed under ID map mount. Second of all, which uh, uh, permission checks need to be uh, need to be updated there. So IOCLs can be a wrinkle, but m most of the time they aren't. Cool. And thank you so much. And uh, have a good day.